Hey, everybody. Welcome. I'm Tom Chandler. I'm dean of the Arnold School. I think I know most of the folks in here today. Thank you for coming out on a lovely afternoon where I guess you could be doing something not uh, more important than this, but certainly something else. But uh, thanks for coming out. Um, welcome, Monica, our speaker today. She's speaking on such an important topic, uh, social determinants of childhood obesity. Uh, when I uh, spoke to Michael about scheduling the lecture for this year, we thought it'd be appropriate to do it right after Thanksgiving, <laughs> since it was an obesity lecture. But um, anyway, Michael's going to introduce our speaker. So without further ado, thank you again all for coming. So first of all, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out for our third annual Norman J uh, Jerry Sue and Norman J. Arnold Childhood Obesity Lecture Series. Um, this lecture series was established in 2016 uh, to showcase the generosity of the Arnolds and their importance that they placed on promoting the health and well-being of all South Car Carolinians, and particularly that of children. But before I introduce today's speaker, I would like to recognize two outstanding Arnold School of Public Health graduate students. As part of the lecture series, we established the Arnold Emerging Scholars and Childhood Obesity Graduate Student Award. This is a competitive scholarship awarded to two graduate students in the Arnold School of Public Health that demonstrate outstanding commitment to scholarship and research in the field of childhood obesity. This year's awards go to Ethan Hunt and Agnes Bucko. On behalf of the Arnolds and the faculty, we uh, thank you for your dedication to the area of childhood obesity, and we look forward to having both of you as colleagues in the not-too-distant future. So our speaker today, Dr. Monica Baskin, holds many titles, as you can see. She is the professor of preventive medicine, the vice chair for culture and diversity in the Department of Medicine at the University of Alabama at Birmingham School of Medicine, she is also the newly appointed Associate Director for Community Outreach and Engagement at the, at the UAB Comprehensive Cancer Center. And she holds a secondary faculty appointment in the Department of Nutrition Science in the UAB School of Health Professions. She's a licensed psychologist by training whose research focuses on minority health and health disparities. She has led an extensive research program using community-based participatory methods to reduce health disparities in the Deep South by addressing individual, family, and environmental factors associated with obesity and related chronic conditions across the lifespan. And as I am sure that many of you who have already met with or know Monica, she's just a fantastic person as well. Today she's going to be presenting on understanding and addressing the social determinants of childhood obesity. So please help me welcome our speaker, Dr. Monica Baskin. to pull this down a little bit so that I won't have to stand on my tippy toes the entire time. <laughs> um, thank you so much. I am definitely honored to be invited to come and um, speak to you a little bit this afternoon about something that I'm certainly excited about and passionate about. Um, it has certainly been almost a homecoming for me to meet with many of you um, and, and get to see some of my old colleagues and friends again. And hopefully, um, I will spark some com communication and discussion about um, where we go from here in terms of childhood obesity, and both in terms of prevention and treatment. So um, a few months back, when, when Glenn um, extended the invitation and said, hey, you know, we have this great lecture series. We'd love for you to come. You know, I, I said, sure, um, I've got a lot of travel in the fall, so let's just come after Thanksgiving. And so um, little did I know that I would be totally exhausted um, having had my oldest daughter to come home for the first time from college. Um, she's a freshman um, this year, and she had literally about 10 items on her mom must cook list um, in that five days that she was home. So. Um, 
so, so I thought about, okay, well, what is it that I could talk about uh, for this brief time that we have today to hopefully um, spark interest, um, motivate you, motivate myself around this very difficult task of trying to combat childhood obesity? And so what I thought about mostly was, okay, um, I'm getting a little up there in age. Um, Yes, having now have to admit that I have a daughter in college. Um, and, you know, I'm at a different phase of my career now where I'm starting to be reflective on, you know, sort of what have I learned and what will be my legacy. So the talk today then is going to kind of walk through what I call sort of four chapters of um, understanding around childhood obesity and some of the complex issues related to social determinants of health and hopefully getting you to be convinced that it's really not as simple as you might think. Um, so firstly, want to talk about, you know, kind of what's the big deal? Why, why are we, we assembled here? Why have I spent um, a good part of my career focusing on these topics? And why should we continue to work um, together to try to address this? And then I'm going to be, you know, pretty frank about what I consider to be the miseducation of a childhood obesity researcher, i.e. myself. Um, and then really talk about kind of what the answers are. And um, at least in my reflection, they're really pretty clear, you know, at least as clear as sort of South Carolina red clay, if you will. And then lastly, conclude with sort of a note um, from my future self to sort of talk about, you know, what it is that in the future um, that I might be telling to someone like myself or to some of you. So what is the big deal? Why, why did um, this initiative get started? Why have you for three years had a lecture series? Why are you um, acknowledging and recognizing fantastic graduate students in this area? And I think that's pretty simple. So this cartoon kind of sums it up. You know, it used to be a time where you'd have to fatten up the kids um, be first before you would go in and, and take them into this wonderful house of horrors. Um, but that's not the case. So pretty much over the last several decades, um, what we've seen is that there's been an increase in childhood obesity for each one of these years of NHANES data. And, and that is pretty alarming. So one in five children between the ages of two and 19 are considered to be obese. And as if that's not enough, we also know that it's not equally distributed. So if we think about the United States, there are certain states um, that tend to have higher rates of obesity than others, and certainly mine and Alabama is one of the areas. And then um, also um, Virginia has an even higher rate with anywhere between 25 to 29 percent of children age two to four. These are preschool children who are receiving um, WIC services are considered to be um, are considered to be obese. And so this is particularly alarming because you're thinking about in those first formidable years of development, you have children that are already um, presenting at um, great risk for um, future complications and problems. And so we know that individuals or children that are obese um, by age four have a 20% likelihood of going on to become um, obese adults. And then when we look at some similar data across the um, you know, ages of 10 to 17, we still see that there are some differences across the U.S. in terms of certain states having higher rates than others. And a saying that we have um, quite often in Alabama, we say, thank God for Mississippi, um, because we don't look, <laughs> okay. Um, so, so we don't look quite as bad often when we look at health issues um, when we compare ourselves. But, but certainly there's, you know, all jokes aside, it's certainly nothing to be laughed at to have 25 to 29 percent of all 10 to 17 year olds um, in the state of Mississippi being um, considered to be obese. And beyond sort of the differences by state, we also know that there are differences um, by sex and age as well. So this is a chart looking at um, the total population of two to, nine, two to 19 year olds, as well as um, separated out by girls versus boys and in the various age groupings. So we see across the board that um, on average, um, 
boys who are age six to 11 have higher rates of obesity um, than girls. And then there's probably about an equal rate of overweight and uh, of obesity, excuse me, for um, girls and boys at um, the highest range of adolescents. But more striking dif differences are seen here in this table looking at two to 19 year olds um, stratified by sex and race. And so non-Hispanic um, black girls um, have higher rates or the highest rates of obesity and Hispanic boys have higher rates of obesity looking at this data from 2015 to 2016. So across the board, whether or not it's gender or sex rather, um, geographic region and racial, um, ethnic differences, we see that there are some disparities in terms of who is more likely to be over overweight and obese. So beyond those things that are not really changeable, your sex, your race and ethnicity, and um, your age group, there are a couple of other things that are more considered to be more modifiable that where we see also see some disparities. So if you are a child that is born um, to parents who have um, achieved a college degree, you are much less likely than a child who has family members or parents who did not have a high school diploma to be obese. In addition, we know that obesity rates for girls ages 10 to 17 who are in lower socioeconomic circumstances um, have rates of obesity that are high as, as high as um, almost 36%. And so certainly, um, educational attainment, socioeconomic status are some of those social determinants um, that really have an influence over who is overweight and who is obese. And if that wasn't quite enough to tell you the story, this is probably the most compelling reason for why um, childhood obesity is a big deal. So there are a myriad of different health problems and consequences um, just specifically in childhood that are associated with childhood obesity. So that's asthma, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, um, abnormal glucose tolerance, fatty liver um, disease, orthopedic problems, psychosocial problems, sleep apnea, type 2 diabetes, bullying, and a host of other things that we know are associated with childhood obesity. And that's beyond those individuals that then progress from childhood obesity to adult obesity. So once you move on to adult obesity, then higher risk of certain types of cancers, cardiovascular disease, um, and so on and so forth. So there are a number of reasons for why it is really critical for the work that you're doing here or that you will be doing in the future um, to ensure that we have um, children that can be healthy and happy. Um, and if that is not as compelling, um, then there's certainly a financial cost also associated with higher rates of childhood obesity. So it's estimated to be um, about, uh, cost about $14 billion annually in just direct health expenses associated with childhood obesity. So health consequences, financial consequences, at the end of the day, it really is a big deal that we have one in five children who are considered to be obese in the United States. So, um, so childhood obesity is a big problem. It's something that when I first started my academic career, I got involved in. And so I really have been very reflective at this point in my career about, well, what have I learned? Um, what have I learned that I really think that I should move forward on? And or what have I learned that really was probably not all that great? And so I'm gonna take a very critical um, lens at, in terms of talking about several of the studies that I've been a part of over the last several years and, um, and then highlight for you sort of at the end what I am taking away from that work. So that's me, <laughs> if you didn't figure that out. <laughs> Um, so my first foray into academia was a, my first position at Emory University in the School of Public Health. Um, some of you I met with earlier, I sort of talked about this serendipity in terms of not really knowing what public health was. And um, I was finishing up my clinical postdoctoral fellowship at Emory School of Medicine. And train, my training director really encouraged us to go and find people who were doing the work that we were interested in and go have a conversation with them, talk to them about how they got into it, um, what would they, what advice they would give you, and so forth. And one of, um, there was a woman in my graduate program who oftentimes talked about her husband doing work in black churches, and I reached out to her, got his contact information, 
Um, that person was Ken Resnikow, who's a professor at Emory in public health. And I went in for what I thought was a very, you know, was going to be a quick conversation. He had just got it, gotten funded um, for this R01 study on Go Girls. And he said, well, just come work for me and you'll learn all you need to know about public health. And so um, I quickly seized the day and, and started working with Ken um, and started there in the School of Public Health. So this study, Go Girls, which is a program um, focused on overweight African-American adolescent females, was the second of his major trials in this population. So the first trial was Go Girls 1, as he called it, um, and it really focused on low-income African-American girls in Atlanta um, living in housing projects. So really trying to go to low resource, um, where the population issues are, and did this intervention. And at the end of the day, they really didn't see a whole lot that was coming out of it. Um, and, and part of the challenge was that it was difficult because there were all these competing issues with people in housing projects and lower incomes. They couldn't purchase the food. They had difficulty, um, um, parents had difficulty managing other children and childcare and so on and so forth. So Ken had this brilliant idea and said, well, you know what, we need to figure out what works for people who don't have these other uh, resource issues. And if we can figure it out there, then we'll go backwards and we'll try to modify it so it'll be for low resource. So Go Girls Two is where I picked up. It was a group randomized trial of girls 12 to 16. Um, they had a BMI of the 90th percentile for age. Um, and some of you might scratch your head, so why 90th? So we usually do 85th and 95th. Um, anyone have any ideas for why we might have picked 90th percentile? It's in the middle, so so people who don't like to make decisions, we just gotta we kind of go in the middle, but not not quite anything else. So it was issue of face validity, if you will. So girls who were coming in at the 85th percentile didn't often kind of look like they were obese. And so it was difficult to kind of recruit them. So we went a little higher. Um, so, and so that, that was how we were able to kind of go in and recruit. But it was an issue because, um, and as you'll see from some of the other notes, we went out and did our formative work. You know, girls made a distinction between what was kind of thick and attractive um, versus, versus what was sort of nasty fat or obese or they, at the time, dating the study, but they talked about sort of people who would show up on Jerry Springer show and so forth. So, so it was really difficult to get girls in that were a little more shapely um, to come into a trial that we were talking about managing their weight um, than it was for girls who looked a little bit heavier. So we went with the 90th percentile and also went with um, a church-based kind of study. So we recruited from within the churches and um, did so for a number of reasons. Uh, one, that you know the church in the African-American community has been a staple around health promotion, so that was one issue. The other one was um, if you've ever been to one of the larger middle and upper income black churches in Atlanta, you would see that they have tremendous resources. So the churches that we partnered with have you know, full scale kitchens and gymnasiums and all kinds of things that we could um, make good use of. And they were oftentimes not being utilized during the week other than on Wednesday Bible study. So um, chose to work with that um, community-based organizations um, those community-based organizations with this. And so, um, like I said, the formative work, parents really struggle. They said, you know, it's difficult for us to have these conversations with our African-American adolescent girls. It's tough to buy clothes. Um, you know, I really think it's not a big deal. She's big boned, you know, she's gonna grow out of it. These were some of the things that, that we were hearing. And then the girls also talked about, in addition to sort of the differences in the body types, they talked about, well, we really don't want to exercise a whole lot because it's going to be really difficult for us to manage our hair. So we you know, designed this trial. Um, so for six months, um, girls came in to either a high intensity intervention or a moderate intensity intervention. The high intensity intervention um, involved weekly sessions for girls and every other week for their, their parent. Typically it was their mother. Um, the moderate intensity was coming in on a monthly basis for girls and every other month for parents. Um, and anyone want to take a venture as to why we did not have a no treatment control group? Any thoughts? Yes. Sir. Community buy-in. Community buy-in. So, so tell me a little bit more. What's that about? 
Well, uh, if people are identified as having an issue and you don't deal with the issue, there's a marketing and, and community relations problem. Absolutely. So Michael, give that guy a gold star. Um, <laughs> All right. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, absolutely. So these were community-based uh, participatory research trials, and when we went out uh, originally, it's not that we aren't good scientists. We know that the, the gold standard is a no treatment or a control group. But when we went out to have partnerships with um, these um, you know, church leaders, they said, well, we know that there's a problem in childhood obesity. You've already told us there's a problem, and you told us that you think that you might know some ways to address this, so we're not going to be randomized for not getting something to help our kids. And so we went with a, um, a trial then that sort of looked at two different interventions, thinking that, you know, once a month, people aren't going to show up, they're not going to have a whole lot of intensity, and still thought it would make a difference. So the, you know, sessions, true to sort of behavioral interventions, there's goal setting, um, identifying what were sort of the high high triggers in terms of caloric intake. Um, there was physical activity within the sessions. There were lots of um, goodies that were given away in terms of token economy. If you did certain things, you got so many points, you were able to cash those in for certain rewards. And then we also had a chef that prepared meals um, and gave out recipes. So everything you can imagine in terms of a um, intensive intervention to address weight and weight management in these adolescent girls. So just highlighting a couple of things um, in terms of you know, what we said about this work. So one of the earlier papers was just sort of talking about how do you design these interventions. And here are a couple of quotes from, from this particular paper. So in developing interventions for African Americans, it's important to keep in mind positive aspects of black culture as they relate to obesity. And this came up because more and more we started seeing lots in the literature that sort of talks about a deficit model. So people who are less than, they don't have their disparities and so forth. And so we thought that it was really important to come from a asset model and a, a period of strength, particularly in working in these community-based settings. And then we also said, you know, how best to achieve a reduction in obesity and its medical consequences without inducing undesirable shifts in body image and attitudes towards food is a formidable but important challenge. Yeah, isn't that hard to do? So what we found was that it was really tough. So when we did get people to say, yeah, obesity, childhood obesity is not a good thing. Um, you have higher risk of all this. But when we had parents say, well, you know, I don't really want to tell her that she's overweight, I don't really want to have these issues. Here's my African-American daughter who is already getting negative feedback from the larger society. I don't want to pile on to that. So we knew going into it, it's really, really tough. We're at one time saying, you know, you know, be, be proud, you know, have a self-confidence, love your body for what it is, but at the same time, we're giving messages saying, um, but you're too heavy, you need to lose weight, you need to do this, and so forth. And then the other thing is, at the end of the day, um, the results paper show intervention was not effective in reducing weight in any significant ways. So although there were some positive fee, uh, findings among high attenders, um, you know, we really just didn't get that. The statistical difference between the two groups was not there, and the overall change from pre to post was very minimal, only about a 0.5 BMI change from the beginning to the end, um, initial weight loss at six months, and then following up one year later. Um, but, true to the miseducation, we always add this in, but, you know, it was likely because of the dose. You know, if we just give them more, they would have done better. So, I took from that very poor advice um, and moved on. Um, this was a time when Ken decided he was taking a sabbatical and then eventually went to Michigan, and so I took my talents and went to UAB. And when I got there, I started a trial, this time funded by um, the Association of Schools of Public Health at the time and the MetLife Foundation, and decided, well, it's difficult to work in community settings. Let's find settings where we can find kids that are already captive. They already have PE, they have great food, they're cafeterias. Let's do some work in schools and really incorporate what we know. Um, and by the way, we still have this disparity around low income and low resource communities, so let's focus there. So this was a um, really a pilot study that we had um, in a single middle school in a low resource community in Birmingham. 
Um, it really started and coincided with some of the new um, school food policies in terms of getting out all the fryers and putting in baked and you know lowering the calories and the salt and sugars and so forth. So when we approached the school system, they were you know all welcome to come in and said we well, you know we've got this program we think it's going to help, and so we we move forward with that. Um, we talked to the nutrition specialists in our formative work as well, talked to them about what are the new policies, how they feel about them, what could they do to support healthy eating um, within the school. And they said, you know, yeah, come on in. You know, we, we think the policy is okay, um, but we'll just let you know kids are going to eat what they're going to eat. They're really not going to eat that, and we're really concerned that they're just going to waste it. Um, but if you want to come, you know, go ahead and come. We also talked to them um, a little bit about, well, what's going to, what, what could make it successful? And they said, well, you know, really, you're doing a great thing coming into the school system, but it's the parents that you need to work with. And then lastly, the teachers and the administrators, when we talked to them ahead of time, again, they were very welcoming of the project, but they kind of said, you know, but we don't have a lot of teachers. We don't have a lot of resources. Uh, we see this as an added resource, but we just want to give you caution. And so we forged ahead with the Eat Smart, Be Smart project and um, implemented that. Where we did similar kinds of things, we, we incorporated health messages onto the bulletin boards, incorporated into a health education class um, that met once a week, um, and we had more intensive physical activity, trained the PE teachers to do more to get kids up and off the bleachers and be more physically active um, through, throughout their PE classes. And we were able to kind of get the school system to agree to lock down the vending machine that did not have healthy foods in there um, during the school day and make it only accessible to um, the teachers and other adults. But again, we came um, to our conclusions, which was, you know, it was received positive to, positively, you know, just like they said, you know, we welcome the program, we'll love it. Um, but it was really difficult to implement. And some of the challenges had to do with classroom management. So these were low resource schools within the public system within Birmingham. And PE classes would literally have anywhere from 60 to 80 individuals in a small gymnasium with very minimal equipment. And so if, um, for those of you who work in school systems that are similar to that, you can imagine what typically would happen is that the boys were, a select group of the boys were playing basketball or something. Um, the other boys were sitting um, on the bleachers or standing up against the wall, gawking at the girls who were on the other side of the bleachers who were likely um, chit-chatting and doing other things. And so you had only a small percentage of those kids who were up doing anything that was, you know, minimally uh, physically active and certainly not doing a lot of um, moderate to vigorous physical activity. The other issue was there was limited staff. So they each, so the school had a individual who was a health educator. Health was a required class for the seventh and eighth graders, which we targeted for this intervention. But the health educator also was the assistant principal, who was also the disciplinarian, who was also, and go on and on and on. So frequently, she was called out of the classroom um, to go and handle some of these other issues. And while we had our staff there that could kind of pick up and, and, and um, um, keep moving, clearly the level of instruction that we thought was going to happen didn't happen often. And then the idea of the parents. So we had a wonderful plan. There were scheduled parent-teacher conferences and um, PTO meetings that were happening. And so we were infusing information into those meetings. But lo and behold, even though we brought in lots of food, um, only a handful of parents would show up every time. So their involvement was quite limited. So at the end of the day, you know, we didn't deliver the intervention um, in nearly as intensive way as we thought. And so we didn't really see anything shift um, in that school year that we were there in that school. And so, you know, it was a pilot study in a single school, so there's limited generalizability, even if we did find anything. But we knew that, you know, again, school-based programs can support nutrition education and increase physical activity, and we certainly wrote about that when we wrote up the results. And just not to just pick on the studies that I've done, we also did a, uh, a systematic review. We sort of looked at school-based interventions and published this paper where we just sort of talked about, you know, is it just another brick in the wall or really is there something out there in school-based interventions? And what we concluded is that, you know, the beneficial effects of existing school-based interventions at the time um, were really rather small. 
Um, and many of them, when people went to go replicate them, could not actually get the findings that the original study found. Um, but, you know, of course, we're optimistic. But still, you know, we think that could be helpful. We're still putting that message out there. Um, so go ahead and do it. Uh, even though we've, <laughs> we've said they don't really work, you know, we're really pushing you to do that. Um, but we said, you know, these novel kinds of school-based interventions then need to be different. Uh, but rather than spend a whole lot of money in doing the large efficacy trials or effectiveness trials, just keep doing the smaller interventions, the one-offs, um, even though we've just said that they're not generalizable. So again, you can kind of get the miseducation that's there. And then I moved on, and so I said, well, okay, so I focus a lot on weight um, and weight management. Let's just tease it apart a little bit. So this was a study funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Active Living Research, and I said, you know, let's stop doing interventions. Let's see if we can figure out what the secret sauce is, and then we'll build up the interventions afterwards. So this was a very straightforward study where we were looking at a simple question. So what are the social cultural predictors of moderate to vigorous physical activity among young adolescents um, living in the Metro Birmingham area? So simple enough. We went out, we gave um, you know, youth, um, we gave them accelerometers, we did lots of surveys, we kind of went in, um, everything that you can imagine and all the wonderful health behavior models, we kind of threw all of that stuff in. But at the end of the day, the only things that really seemed to be associated with moderate to vigorous physical activity was that if you were a female, you're not really getting that active. And that if you had support, uh, family social support, and you had some confidence around doing physical activity, you were more likely to be engaging in moderate to vigorous physical activity. But let's not be fooled. Only a small handful of all the children were reaching anywhere near the recommendation. So probably um, no more than a third of them were actually meeting recommendations. But, you know, again, as, as wonderful um, scientists who are miseducated, we said, but we still need to get in there. We need to do interventions. We need to tackle those complexities. Um, even though we didn't really find a whole lot, we should still move ahead with these interventions. And so the other thing that we did um, looking at this study was sort of say, well, let's try to think about, well, what are those unique elements? So we, we uh, took a part of the study, a similar cohort, where we tried to tease out, well, what do teens think about what's gonna help motivate them to be physically active. So we used a more participatory um, design here using concept mapping, and we had um, adolescent girls and boys to sort of come up with you know, what are the main issues and then kind of rate and rank them. So nine themes came of that work. So they talked about you know, um, what's gonna really motivate them to be more physically active is they can be physically active with their friends. Um, they had support from their family and from friends. There are resources in the community in order to do this physical activity. Um, that they got some inspiration uh, from someone, you know, um, an athlete, a school teacher, or somebody they admired really encouraged them to do the, uh, to be physically active. If there were things in their daily routine that it just kind of happened all, you know, anyway, they were more likely to do it. So if they had to do chores, um, and then they talked about the pressure from their social network. So you know, the team-based sports or friends kind of egging each other on to do that. And then also seeing and hearing a little bit more about when you are physically inactive, what that does to your body. And so we separated out the data to try to look at the themes, and they were pretty consistent across girls and boys. The only exception was that for girls, having that pressure from their social networks was even more important than it was for, for boys. And so again, we conclude, hey, there's some clear patterns there. Um, we should go at it, you know, even though we don't know exactly what they are, um, they may be differential here, um, but, but again, we concluded, keep forging ahead. And so we did, so looked at sort of the individual behavior, um, looked at, um, teased out the physical activity piece, and so we said, well, what about the food environment? You know, what's happening there? So this is a series of a couple of um, subcontracts that I had through the African American Collaborative Collaborative Obesity Research Network, funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and sort of targeted two kind of questions. So one was about, you know, what are the caregivers of these younger children, three to 11? Um, what do they think is really relevant to the food environment and contributing to excess calorie intake? And then the other one, because we wanted to move into action at some point, was, 
you know, could we start framing this issue around targeted marketing as a social justice issue? So we're focusing on African Americans. We're in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, you know, sort of certainly one of the birthplaces of lots of things around social justice and civil rights. Um, could we start framing that? So that was kind of what we were focusing on. And so we, we pulled some of the data with a couple of other sites um, in North Carolina and in Chicago and in California. And collectively, we, um, we published this paper that really just talked about, so what is that element of price? So we sort of hear people say, I'd love to eat more healthy, but it costs so much more to do that. So we looked at this qualitative study, and so price did emerge as a primary influencing factor about eating healthy. Um, but it was not quite as cut and dry. So people said, yeah, but I'll come up with the money if it's really convenient. If, you know, if on the way to soccer practice, um, I can stop by and get this. I'll pay the little extra money and we'll find it. Um, if, the, if they perceive the food to be higher quality, um, then price wasn't a factor. Um, if they thought it was more healthy or healthful, they would still pay the higher price. And then probably the one that, was, um, that came up highest was, well, it's just the food that my family likes to eat, so we'll do that. So, so while they said cognitively price matters, there were all these other caveats where it didn't really matter if it were some of these other issues. Um, the food pricing strategy that encouraged consumptions of healthy foods, you know, may have relevance across this, this population that we were particularly targeting around African Americans. Um, and we did so across education and income levels. Um, so we saw that, and so we said, you know, of course, okay, well, let's keep pushing. Let's keep moving ahead um, and doing this work and just kind of figure out a way to kind of manage this. Um, certainly easier said than done. And then when we had a deep dive just into the Birmingham group, um, we looked at, so what what about that social um, justice framework? Could we do that? Um, do parents feel like it is not tolerable for there to be targeted marketing of unhealthy foods in communities that are already reeling with um, higher rates of mortality, mortality and morbidity around a number of issues? So what we found was that parents said, yeah, you know, that's horrible. People should not be targeting um, the, the marketing of these unhealthy foods in our area. It probably does um, contribute to eating more calories than necessary. Mm, but this particular company hires a lot of high school kids, or this company sponsors our baseball league, or this company does this or that. And so it's kind of OK. So again, no real clear-cut message there. Um, so it was very difficult for us to then say, we're going to move ahead. So these are kind of the, the five sort of things I picked up from my miseducation as a childhood obesity researcher. Um, and so being puzzled about what, where do we go and what do we do with childhood obesity. So from the first study, the Go Girls, we said, you know, when an obesity intervention doesn't work, just give them more of it. Um, just keep doing it. And then many, many, many trials talk about that. We talk about it's the dose response, it's this, it's that. Um, we very rarely just say, hey, it doesn't work. We need to move on to something totally new. Um, the other miseducation, I think, was about this idea that these small school-based interventions, again, they're, they're not generalizable. Um, but then when we say, well, these larger effectiveness trials don't really work, so let's just go back to the smaller um, trials. So again, what are we talking about? That is, that is totally crazy. But again, many of us have said that, and we, we still find a way to say, but it's my program. It's really going to work. We just need more time. We need more money. We need more, more, more. Um, we also learned from, uh, or I also learned that, you know, this peer pressure could be a good thing, at least for physical activity in girls, um, but at what level does it take it over the top? And so we really couldn't discern, you know, at what point and who are those models to best do that. Um, we also just learned, you know, about, just I mean, just mentioned food price is an important um, aspect, um, but it's, you know, when the food is convenient, may not be as much of an issue. And then targeted marketing of unhealthy food is bad, except when it comes from companies that support the community. So, you know, if you're like me, you know, you sort of see, okay, this is really clear as mud. Uh, what do you do, and how can you really move the needle? So I was challenged a little bit at, um, at, at dinner last night and sort of talking about kind of, well, what am I doing in childhood obesity? And so it was a, a pause for me to kind of reflect on 
well, what am I really doing about it? And why did I start gravitating to other kinds of populations and doing the work? And I think as I've been honest with myself and reflective, I think it's because it's so darn hard to move the needle. Um, there's been a lot of science out there, but at the end of the day, there's really not been a whole lot happening. And I think the reason why that is, is because of these other factors that influence health. So when we're talking about social determinants, it's more than just the actual health behaviors. Um, so I really like this graphic from um, Dr. Braveman and colleagues where, you know, we certainly know that personal behavior um, is a contributor to um, our health and somewhere between, you know, around 30% of health is determined by the behaviors. So, you know, that's pretty, you know, pretty consistent. Um, but because I also work in the School of Medicine, you know, I'm oftentimes reminding my colleagues that medical care, despite how much we really focus a lot on um, this issue around medical care, it only accounts for about 10%, um, no more than 20% of the determinants of our health. So it's those other things out there. It's the you know, living and working conditions in our homes and communities. It's the economic and social opportunities and resources that at the end of the day, whether or not it's childhood obesity or some other health issue, these are the things that really make or break whether or not somebody is gonna be healthy or whether or not they're gonna be sick or how early or how late that they, um, they, they end their, li their lives in. Um, so policies to promote economic development and reduce poverty and reduce racial segregation are really key to addressing those social determinants, as well as policies uh, to promote child and youth development and education from infancy through college. So if you remember some of the, um, the earlier data in terms of parents who've gone on to have a college education, their children are much less likely. So less than 10% of their children are going to be um, uh, are going to be obese. So it's really important to address that um, that kind of, those kinds of policies, and then promoting healthier homes, healthier neighborhoods, healthier schools, and workplaces can also be the areas where um, more attention is necessary to really um, crack and move the needle in terms of childhood obesity. So, you know, this is another way to kind of think about those social determinants. So that 40% that we say are those sort of those social aspects, it's your education, um, your economic stability. So basically, you know, having food security, knowing that you'll have a place to, to sleep and go and go to, you have transportation and so forth. That social and community context, so who's around you, your social cohesion, those things make up a large part of, of our health. Um, the neighborhood and built environment, so whether or not you're living in an environment where you can walk out and feel safe and comfortable um, engaging in physical activity, whether or not there's a grocery store um, or some other convenient place for you to purchase healthier foods, um, whether or not there are toxins in your environment, all of these things can pay, play a major role in addition to, like I said, the health care and then those um, health behaviors, physical activity, diet, um, smoking, and other behaviors um, as well. So, um, so big issues are really important. One of the ones that I have spent some of my time doing is in this space around, um, you know, place. And so many of you have probably heard something like this phrase of your zip code may be as important as your genetic code in predicting your health outcomes and life expectancy. And a lot of this, as we've um, in, in uh, Birmingham and Jefferson County, Alabama, where I am, you know, we've shown this in a series of GIS maps about specifically which census tracts you live in can play a big difference as much as 20 to 30 year difference in your life expectancy, depending on being in one track versus the other. And so neighborhood conditions, the schools that you go to, your access to healthy, affordable foods and access to health care, all of those things are really oftentimes relegated in terms of the places where you live, you work, you play, you go to school. And so that has a very long history in the U.S. of determining um, who is wealthy, I mean, who is healthy, who is sick, and who lives longer. And then there's this issue about um, when we do think about policies, there are inequities that exist. So when we try to think about things on the left there, you see we, you know, everybody's the same. We're going to give them all that same um, policy and apply it across the board. That's what we're really fighting for. Um, but if you see the picture on the right, 
Um, it's really more about giving people what they need in order to sustain themselves, to be healthy, and so forth. So the individual who's trying to see the ball game, um, who is extremely tall, didn't even need a box to be able to see the ball game if that was the outcome you were desiring. Um, the, the person in the middle there, you know, one box was still not going to be enough. She's still going to be on her tippy toes. Um, like somebody up front, um, but uh, but two boxes would actually give her help her to sit, um, be able to see over the t over the top, and then we very rarely think about those individuals um, who may have other kinds of physical or mental health um, disabilities, and so whether or not you gave this person ten boxes or not. Um, the person in the wheelchair was still not going to be able to see over that fence because what they in fact needed was that ramp. So. Um, you know, I wouldn't be a public health researcher if I didn't talk about the ecological model. So I'll promote the ecological model um, in terms of one of the ways to think about childhood obesity so, um, and what we need to do about it. So it, it's a model that assumes that health is a function of multiple environmental subsystems. So it's the individual, it's the family, it's the community, it's the workplace, it's our beliefs and our traditions, it's our economics, our physical environment, and social relationships. These are all very, very important and very complex. So effective childhood obesity prevention and treatment then also must be comprehensive. We can't, is there, there's not a one size fits all kind of a situation. Um, we really need to be comprehensive and think about all of those systems and ideally at once in order to really get um, to meaningful and sustainable change. Um, and then we can't forget uh, um, the, uh, how we need to address the health disparities. Um, you know, we've got different groups depending on where you live in the country, depending on whether uh, you're male or female, what racial ethnic group you belong to, um, all things are not equal and therefore our solutions should not be about e um, equal um, opportunities as well. So lastly then, um, here's a note from my future self. Um, so which way are we going um, and so forth. So my future self, um, sort of in retirement, maybe somewhere between 15, 20 years from now, has written me a note and has funneled it back to me here today. And here are a couple of things that are in that. First and foremost, in red letters, we've got to stop filling up those buckets. Um, so, you know, we're focusing on population health. And, you know, the traditional model is, you know, we're just kind of scooping out the water. We're totally disregarding the fact that there's a huge hole in that boat. We have hit this iceberg or this big rock um, that is the social determinants. And we have not yet figured a way to either get that out of the way um, and to patch up our boat and move forward. So a lot of what we do in childhood obesity research is kind of the little patchwork. Um, we'll do something here. We're down stream, um, we'll, we'll focus on that, and we're not at all dealing with the root causes of why certain people are um, more prone to be overweight and obese than others. So issues like poverty, issues like economic stability, issues like housing, issues like racial segregation, these are the real core issues that result in the downstream things that we see. My other um, note from my future self is saying to do more impactful research. So part of what I know as I've transitioned to being a more senior scientist, um, it's really important for me to leave a legacy that says um, there's something that's going to be different about when I retire than when I was in this game. Um, so it's not just the fact that I can get you know, a couple research projects and fund quality graduate students and, and staff. Um, it's something more about well, what are we really learning? What is the innovation? What is the impactful research? So better understanding and addressing the complexities that are there, not running and hiding because it is complex, um, but also not sugarcoating. When things don't work, they just don't work. We, you know, it's not going to help to give more of the same bad stuff. We need to think differently. Um, we also want, need to design and implement interventions that, again, tackle the iceberg. So um, no, as single researchers, we're not going to address poverty. Um, but if we are working collaboratively across multiple sectors, we can have some pretty darn good ideas about what it might take to help people to not live in poverty, to not go through a spiral of um, limited education, limited income, limited ability to lead helpful lives. And then we also need to develop the analytical um, approaches that go along with. So a lot of um, 
you know, institutes now within NIH are talking about these multi-level interventions, but we haven't yet figured out the analytics for doing that. So I'm, you know, a proponent of, yes, let's do all these things and do them at once, but how do we know which of these things work? So there are some research methods now and approaches like the most designs and other things that you can kind of help you figure out which components work and test them out before you put them all together. Uh, but we really need to figure out what are those analytical, analytical approaches to help us tease that out to know whether or not something is really working or not. And then we, once we found, find those wonderful things, we got to find ways to better disseminate and implement, implement those efficacious interventions. Oftentimes, um, as researchers, we, you know, we, we get the grant, we do the work, we get the great publication, we sit it on a shelf, and those people who need the interventions the most never get it. It's never designed for them. Um, so the Go Girls project was wonderful, uh, but it was never really designed to be implemented on a wide scale. You know, we don't have huge churches on every corner that have gym full-scale gymnasiums and swimming pools and things like that. Um, we don't have the ability to have a, a master's level dietitian or exercise physiologist to run those programs. So we need to think about programs from the start that can be easily disseminated out to the audiences that need it. And then we've got to help to create healthy futures. So I think starting um, with that young generation, um, thinking about those two to four year olds who are already um, having higher rates of obesity, we've got to start young and we've got to make sure that we are all working collaboratively to have um, healthy futures for um, folks that look like these kids. Thank you.